Good morning, everybody. This is Pastor Chris from First Connecticut Open Bible Church. Thank God for each and every one of you who are here. We're going to be teaching today on, uh, on Pentecost, and the title of today's message is When the Day of Pentecost Was Fully Come. And um, we want to start off by praying, and I'm going to read a couple of passages of Scripture, and I believe that God's going to start to show us a couple of things on Pentecost that hopefully we'll be able to understand a little bit better. Precious Father in heaven, thank you, because you are the God who fulfills his promise. You're the God whose word is consistent, and because you are the way, the truth, and the life, you are truth, so whatever you say comes to pass. Because you're a righteous, Lord God, whatever you say to do is right. So we come before you and we thank you, Lord. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit says to us today. And we ask in the name of Jesus during this time and this season in Pentecost that you would start to fill each and every vessel that's hungry and thirsting with your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> We're looking at Acts chapter 2. Now I'm going to read a large, a, a relatively larger portion of scripture than we normally do. But at the same time, what we want to do is I want to, I want to, today's more about teaching it's not going to give you a, a necessarily a shout, but it's going to do something in your heart. Uh, when the Word of God is spoken, the Word of God is powerful. And, and we need to remember that. And when we hear the Word of God, it has the capability of changing and transforming each and every one of our lives. So today we're looking at Acts chapter 2, in a day where no one's life would ever be the same. This is the day that the fulfillment of the promise of God from the Old Testament all the way back has come to pass. Acts chapter 2 verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked are all these who were speaking Galileans. Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Now, one thing I do want to state is that when we hear the term tongues, there's a very large um, misconception of that. And I want to start to clear it up by reading a couple of passages of scripture, and then we'll talk about the differential, and we'll, 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 we'll sort of dis bring a distinction to each there are tongues, the tongues that are spoken about in this particular passage of scripture is extremely clear. It's talking about a language, a particular language that the people came together and they heard. Now, here's an amazing thing, and I want you to think about the effect that this might have on you. If somebody, if, if you were to go into a different country, uh, let's take any country, any country. Let's say you were to go to Turkey, okay? You would go to Turkey, and all of a sudden you would go into a temple, maybe as a, even just a sightseer. You'd go into the temple, and then all of a sudden, somebody, they're all speaking Turkish, they're all doing the worshiping in, in, in Turkish, and all of a sudden, somebody comes, and they start to speak in English, and they start to say something that you have had a sense that was being spoken to you in a direction in life and a blessing that was going to come upon you as a result of where you are speaking right directly to you 
of miracle that God is doing in your life but hasn't completed yet, that would have an amazing effect on how you look and how you see things. That would give you, that would start to encourage you in your faith. That would at least, minimally, even if you're a skeptic, and, there's, and there's, the Bible doesn't condemn skeptics, by the way. There's no, there's, there's no condemnation for those who are skeptical because they're, you know, Thomas was skeptical. But he was one who said, listen, if I'm going to go all the way, I need to go all the way with something that's true. And if I need to know something's true, I need to know it. Nothing wrong with that. Everybody has different levels of faith. But now what happens is they started to speak the wonders of God, miracles that happened to God, personal things that nobody could know about you in your language, from a foreign language, that you, from a person you never met. You'd at least start to think about God, you at least start to, uh, you at least the minimally, you would start to think, what could this be? Minimally, you'd start to examine a little deeper. Minimally, it would be a pebble in your shoe that that allows you to, that makes you or compels you to de desire to move forward in understanding, is this real? Because nobody's in. These are God fearing people. But listen to, if you listen to the responses that they gave after the fact, some said maybe they're drunk. How could they be, but you know, so, so people come and people have different levels of understanding. They're all God-fearing people. But maybe these people are drunk. Maybe these people had too much to drink, but it's early in the morning. Mm. These are God-fearing people. These aren't necessarily, you could be skeptical and God-fearing at the same time. Being skeptical does not mean you're unbelieving. Being skeptical means that you need to understand, you need to make sure, God, I, I, I know you're there, I believe that you're there, but I need, I, I, there's just something I need more. God doesn't condemn those people. But there's a difference between that kind of tongue and speaking in that way and speaking in a tongue like we understand in the, in the Pentecostal world. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1. Follow the way of love. Now, he's talking to people that were an abusive people. They would, they would try to show off. You always, never, you, know, you always find those people who try to show off because they talk as if they're holy, but their life doesn't match with it. Those are people that most commonly a lot of folks like to call hypocrites. It doesn't mean that they're not authentic. It means that they haven't arrived to the place or they're not mature enough to recognize they have needs just as much as anybody else. And it's the grace of God that's come upon them that brought them to a place of understanding. But Paul says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Holy Spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone, now watch this, anyone who speaks in a tongue, listen to me here, does not speak to people but to God. So now what happens is over here we're seeing a distinction between an actual language spoken to people for the edification of people and a tongue that somehow or another comes supernaturally that God just gives you or puts words in you that you don't understand. Because it's not in a tongue of necessary civilization. It's in a tongue in a, in a heavenly language. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. No one, by the way. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves. But the one who prophesies edifies the church. You see, what's happening is the Apostle Paul is talking about in this passage of Scripture in, in, in 2 Corinthians uh, 10, 14.1, uh, He's talking about edifying the church. What happens is when we can get, and it's not impossible, we cannot get, um, 
we need to be able to edify others and we need to I, we need to identify by edifying other people in church when we pray in spirit and we pray in a tongue some people can get a little spooked about that and I could sort of understand that but here's the thing here's the misunderstanding when you're when you're praising God and you just say something and all of a sudden just certain words just flow out you don't understand it but you just have a sense Okay, it's not being spiritually spooky, but what it is doing is you're, you, you get edified, you're, you're caught up. You're caught up in a words that come out that may not be necessarily intelligible, but it's not for, the other, not for other people. It's in a place where you're caught up in rapture with God, where sometimes you say when you're in love with somebody, you may not even have the words. What happens is God puts the words in you. That's what it is talking about, a heavenly language, coming back to God. I would like, he says, Paul says this, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. So he's not talking about, now this is post, this is post Jesus era. He says, I would not, he, he's not condemning tongues, he's not saying that tongues have ended. But I would rather have you prophesy. Why? Because what happens is, our focus as Christians need to be the edification of other people. It doesn't, it shouldn't be necessarily the edification of ourselves always. What happens is we start to get filled up, and when, when your cup overflows, now excess flows over to other people. And what happens is that excess that flows over to other people starts to edify them, starts to strengthen them, starts to encourage them, starts to empower them, starts to enable them to do the will of God and to live with a clean conscience and a clean heart. He goes on and he says this, The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets, so that the church may be edified. Now, we remember, we established that there is, an, there is a tongue that is for other people, and then there's a tongue that's in edification and in prayer to God. For if I pray in a tongue, the Apostle Paul says in verse 14, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. In other words, I don't know necessarily what I'm saying. But I'm praying something that God understands. I'm praying something that's intercepted by the power of the Holy Spirit and translated according to the needs of the people. Verse 15. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. We need to understand what we pray as well. It's important. Because we're relational people. And God wants us to relate with other people. And God wants us to care about other people. And when you pray about other people, that's the greatest... That's the greatest um, display of caring for people, whether it's with them or whether it's alone. And here's the one thing: when we're going to pray for when we're going to pray for people, we want to pray for people, and we want to be authentic. We want to pray for them when we're in our prayer time. Don't say you're going to pray for somebody and not do so. That's not going to be fruitful. But verse 16 says, otherwise, when you're praising God in the spirit, how can someone else? who now puts in the position of an inquirer say amen to your thanksgiving, since they do not know what you're saying. I thank God that I pray in tongues more than all of you. The Apostle Paul prayed in tongues. So what we want to look at today is we want to look at, I, I just wanted to clarify about tongues, what the issue is. There is, an, a, there is a tongue of nation, of language that you're speaking to edify other people, and then there's a tongue that you pray in your private time. But we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. In other words, they were in one accord. Now, this message is about the day we call Pentecost in our church calendar. We need to, we need to, you need to have careful exposition when we're dealing with this text, because if we don't uh, carefully exposition this text, it's, which is very important, because if we go wrong here, we're going to go wrong with the rest of the